All right, so we're, we're going to start in a couple of minutes. Just hope a few more people will join us. Maybe waiting for them, we can um, just uh, say a few introduction words. So you probably know me by then, by now. Um, so I'm Sandra Mignon. I work with Plan International as a CAFAG advisor, and I'm also the co-lead of the CAFAG task force. And today with Raniere, we will um, facilitate this session on children associated with gangs and organized crime, uh, organized crime groups in Latin America and the Caribbean. So this is the last session of the conference. I hope you still have a bit of energy for this session, a little bit. So with this session, uh, we actually be um, uh, in two parts. So the first part of the session will focus on the differences between armed violence and armed conflict and the legal framework that is associated with each of these contexts. So during this week, we already had like, some conversations about this. Uh, so today is the chance to go a little deeper into uh, those uh, differences. We have uh, experts who can uh, tell us more. And the second part of the, the session will focus on programs. So what can be done to support these children and to prevent the recruitment in the region, but also in three countries in Brazil, Haiti and Honduras. All right, so there is uh, some knowledge in the room. That's great. Uh, hopefully this will still be useful um, for you. And also, I think, a space for all of us to learn more um, from this region and on this uh, particular um, situation of uh, armed violence. So now we'll hand over to uh, Anier. It's very important for everyone to use their translation devices. This will be a bilingual, almost trilingual session. I have the honor of starting by presenting the panelists. I do have the honor of presenting Hector Saul Hernandez from Honduras, International Relations and a Master of International Cooperation for, the, for Development. He's worked at the Secretariat of Foreign Affairs at USID in Honduras since 2021. He's a protection associate from UNHCR in Tegucigalca, Jennifer. Jennifer Michelle Cartagena, she is a social psychologist and a master's and she works as a polygraph organizer in Honduras. She coordinates the program of family integration and reunification in Northern Zona 2023. Welcome. We also have Kendra Gregson. She's a regional advisor for child protection for the UNICEF for Latin America and the Caribbean. Focus on child protection services and public policies for the prevention and the response to violence. She's worked in development and humanitarian context. Welcome, Kendra. We also have our colleague, Marianela Fuertes. She's from Colombia. She's an attorney in human rights. She's worked for UNDP and also for the Colombian Human Rights Services. Joisa works with the institutional court and she's a subdirector of the also a professor this presentation will be in portuguese so let's listen to the portuguese first eu quero fazer uma apresentação em português de rosana vega que é argentina psicóloga formada é, em uh, psicologia com mestrado em direitos em direitos de crianças e adolescentes, e especialista em direito de crianças e adolescentes e violência, e é chefe de proteção infantil do Unicef Brasil e também coordenadora da agenda Cidade Unicef em Brasil. Eu sou Ana Varga, da Argentina, e especialista em direitos e ela é a chefe de child protection, child and adolescence Unicef Brasil, e também a coordinadora da Nacional Initiative UNICEF, Agenda Ciudad. And we have today with us Sterlinda Vital. Uh, Sterlinda is Haitian lawyer with a master's degree in international humanitarian law and human rights. She's a specialist in child rights. She works with UN and uh, the National Children Protection Offices uh, for the Civil Servant Society. 
um, working with the issues around armed violence and armed conflict in Central, Amer Central in the Central African Republic. She is the founder of Chronic Dua and Fun for Children Awareness and Protection. Welcome everyone to the session. So now I would like to, you know, say something very interesting. I'd like to start this session first by inviting Maria Nella so that she can support us and so that we can understand what's the difference between armed violence and armed conflict. Our teacher and professor, Maria Nella, we give you the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for being here until the very end. We do hope that we have the energy to be able to wrap up three days of learning. Specifically for me, I am an academic at heart. Therefore, all the work that has been done here, it's very important, not only in learning for me, but it's been a privilege to be able to hear the very big experiences and also the knowledge in this room. I'll be speaking in Spanish. And also I'd like to first thank the people that are doing the translation for us and um, being very aware of the way in which I speak so that I can speak in a rhythm one yes to comply with our timetable and our schedules but ensuring that we can help out so that the translation can be carried out I've had no opportunity to talk about the institute because it's a very long story but the topic here I wanted to start in a very academic and talking about different concepts but because of time constraints and among many things I've learned in the past three days and I hope you do allow me if I can start with a metaphor so let's say if us that work in a humanitarian crisis talk about a humanitarian crisis let's say a like a big fire like the fires that are now happening that means that you need to be prepared and ready to react because fires wait for no one so we cannot sit down and wait to have the discussions as to who are the actors who are the stakeholders and what's the legal framework that would be applied things need to get done so in this specific topic the difference between armed violence and armed conflict differences sounds like a luxury when we have the situations so which feels like this crisis is a fire that we need to put out so if we are fire persons then we need to be able to be ready for it right and after the crisis we need to start with all the different analysis and what type of fire was and how to further prevent it and in that sense what sort of tools do i need to use to be able to put out the fire therein is where this conversation between the armed conflict and armed violence fulfills a fundamental role for latin america i don't want to extend what I mean to the rest of the world in this specific point but I think it's very important that we should understand that for Latin America armed violence it's a very important topic that must be recognized and we should give it its due space in the organization that I work for the prevention of the recruitment and use I know that for Colombia we have an additional element in regards to how sort of sophistication they're using. Boys, girls, and adolescents are being used. And then after all that, we say armed conflict, but in our organization, having training material and having different projects and undertaking projects on our own behalf in the work that we do in Latin America, we've started to stop and say it's an armed conflict in very specific places where it is declared but in other places it's not and it does not mean that we cannot talk about recruitment so what are the characteristics of that specific recruitment so here the distinction in regards to definitions 
And why do we need definitions? Definitions give us the legal framework. As we've talked about, and they define roles and responsibilities, but they also define accountability processes. Under that same token, the, the armed conflict is under international humanitarian law, IHL, and also international human rights. But the main legal framework that is used is IHL, international human specifically when we talk about armed conflict, international humanitarian law. Who are the actors that are part of this armed conflict? And I understand very well that it's not a legislation that is separate of human rights, but it should also be used to inform domestic law or national law and be used and included as fundamental elements that are part of protection and protection of boys, girls, and adolescents. In that sense, I am not saying that we talk about this topic and not about the other. No, what I am saying specifically is how we need to start these conversations. This is not something we're going to start here, but it's a call to action to have this conversation in Latin America. Well, we don't have anything to be able to put out the fire? Well, maybe not, but we've had wonderful discussions, specifically here. I had the opportunity of hearing what has been done in Mexico and the work done by UNICEF in Mexico. It's quite fantastic in regards to working with the government and working with UNICEF to create a protection system that makes no distinction. It's strengthening the entire protection system ensuring that it also has the opportunity to be able to respond to those other types of crises. That's an example that's very important, specifically when we talk about in regards to the implementation of international instruments, considering IHL as the guiding principle and as part of international humanitarian law, which is what we have in regards to the legislation of armed violence, which is defined by domestic law and is typified as a criminal behavior. It's considered criminal. And what are the sanctions out there that are quite specific? Another very important point to handle Latin America, what is the legitimate use of force, not only to face in the matter, to be able to handle this type of violence? And then there is a speech in regards to law and order, where we think about what is the concept of security that we hold in our minds. And when we talk about the concept of security, then we start to talk about roles and responsibilities of the whole security sector. And the security sector being part of the discussion should also be a fundamental part of the solution. None of what we talk about humanitarian intervention could happen if we don't have a minimum amount of security to ensure that we're able to provide some sort of humanitarian assistance. And this is where the Alert Institute, uh, we are here to be able to show that the fact that we do share between armed conflict and armed violence, if we share fundamental elements and it's because it's manifestations of the lack of the state or a dysfunctional state at heart. But it does not mean that the way in which we put out the fire are not important. And to give Latin America an opportunity in the international context to be able to be able to present its problem with the criminal organizations, which obviously recruit to mostly boys, girls, and adolescents in Latin America. Thank you. Muchas gracias, profesoras. Hemos aprendido entonces. Thank you so much, Professor. And now we've learned the concept and the difference between armed conflict and armed violence. And now I'd like to continue on and with Marianela and ask about impact. What are the implications of the impact of armed 
conflict and armed violence, the legal implications in the stock specifically. Gracias. Thank you. The legal implications, as we all know, the legal frameworks define roles and responsibilities. And we do have deficiencies in regards to impl implementation. We will find that recruitment in the domestic legislation, it could either be or not be a behavior defined as a crime. And it could highlight the level of dysfunctionality in regards to violations of the rights of boys, girls, and adolescents. When we talk about inter international law, when we talked about armed conflict, now there is a robust development in regards to what it means. There are severe violations in regards to what it means. There's some monitoring and there's a record country by country in regards to declaring an armed conflict, meaning that at the international level, the system exerts a very important pressure. And the way in which countries comply with the legislation and comply with IHL based on the human rights of protection and guaranteeing the security of boys, girls, and adolescents, but in the domestic legislation, if there is no visibility on this topic, then what we would face as a situation where then it's part of another dysfunction of the state. In the international protection system, boys, girls, and adolescents in an armed conflict are victims. That's very clear. They are victims of the adults that bring about the war and push war factions forward. There's a distinction in regards to treating them as having agency of their own decisions, but they're victims, and this is in legal terms specifically. And there's a robust system of protection in that sense. When we talk about the legal framework of IHL, which is very well developed, applying international human rights has further enriched the manner in which the parties in combat could and should respond to the protection of boys, girls, and adolescents. Nevertheless, and I'd like to highlight this point when we talk about international human rights does not forbid that during combat of armed groups, it does not forbid killing children. It's actually allowed. It's part of the armed conflict. Obviously, there's a lot of criteria that could be taken into consideration, and they're mandated that the state forces should consider it. But it continues to be a basic, basic principle in regards to the difference here. And this, that's the implication. Why am I highlighting this fact? Because a lot of sectors in Latin America state that we should use IHL to be able to face the criminal groups that have become destabilizers of states. So let's ask ourselves if that is what we're actually seeking. I raise my voice and alert. Point number two, in regards to legal implications within our national systems, boys, girls, and adolescents are subject to criminal law and anyone under criminal law in the reference document the Marantis and Luna presented day one, we talked about criminalizing poverty. We talked about the specific territory of the racial implication and discrimination in regards of recruitment and the use of children on behalf of criminal organizations. When in Colombia we ask the question, why is it that they recruit a lot more indigenous children and children from Afro communities? The community leaders would answer us that 
it's not just because of discrimination and because they're more vulnerable. Well, these children know the territory. They allow us to move about the jungle. It's because they have this ancient knowledge which the armed groups require. And finally, the responsibility of all the activities in regards to organized crime will be part of the criminal policy of a state. And what is the definition of a criminal policy of a state in regards to the protection of boys, girls, and adolescents? When we talk about law in America, there is no policy that considers these children that have been recruited by armed groups under protection. In order to add another layer on that discussion, I want to invite Sister Linda to ask, uh, to reply us, what are the legal implications of the context of armed conflict versus armed violence? Once again, thank you for having me. Um, ICRC, according to ICRC, around 124, there is a 120 armed conflict around the world. And those conflicts are divided into international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. But sometimes the distinction, the classification is so complex such as in the situation of Haiti, that obs some observers are doubting how to classify this kind of situation. The line may be so thin, so they could easily slide into a confusion. So that's the reason why tonight I was asked to talk about the legal implication of non-international um, international armed conflict, armed conflict as a whole, and armed violence. So, armed conflict as con are considered has, has high threshold hostilities that may happen between two or more states. In such case, we are talking about international armed conflict or between a non-armed group and a, a state in such case, or among armed groups themselves, in such case, we are talking about non-international armed conflict. Some situation like occupation, self-determination, armed conflict are also considered as international armed conflict. In such case, the applicable law is international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law aim at limitate the level of casualties, as well as the means of war. And in international armed conflict, the applicable law is Geneva Convention, the four Geneva Convention, the optional protocol one, the Ag Convention, and in situation of non-international armed conflict, we have the common article three of the four Geneva Convention, the optional protocol two, as well as other, um, as other soft law. And in situation of armed conflict, children are being protected by international, armed conf international humanitarian law as, law, as much as um, other uh, law, such as um, Paris principle as a soft law, optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in situation of armed violence, which is considered as the use or threat and of use of weapons to inflict injury, death, or psychosocial harm, there are no protection. Civilians are not really enduring protections. Civilians are purposely targeted, such as in the situation of Haiti. For the year of 2023, 184 attacks have been um, conducted by armed gangs, and 180 of them were um, were targeted civilian population. In situation of non-international, in situation of armed, con, of armed violence, I'm sorry, uh, the domestic law is applying as well as international human rights law. In situation of armed conflict, we have the monitoring and reporting mechanism, which is a very efficient tools 
that enable the UN Security Council to listing parties to the conflict that are using children uh, for armed purposes as uh, enshrined in the resolution 1998-8082 and also the list of naming and shaming which is a very efficient tool. To the contrary, in situation of armed violence, there's no such tool and children are not being protected as they were supposed to be. And the protection of children remain challenging in situation of armed violence because we don't have access to the armed gangs and children are being used with no um, means to really protect those children. Thank you. We have learned about the concepts and the difference between armed conflict and armed violence and the legal implications. I would like to bring this closer to us. And if you agree, I would like to ask you to please stand up if you or anyone you know personally has suffered or has been a victim of armed violence. Please stand up if you or anyone you know has been a victim of armed violence. Piensa lo que pasó. Think about what happened to you or to that person and who did it. Was it a woman? Was it a man? Do you remember the age you had or the person had? Was it an elderly, an adult, a child, an adolescent or youth? Please, if you feel safe by walking out at night in your neighborhood or in the city, you may sit down. If you feel comfortable you may see it. If you believe that armed conflict and armed violence directly affect your daily lives in your country. And if you believe that public security measures in your city are efficient in the prevention of armed conflict, you may sit down. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Many of you that were sitting down and getting up, this is a way to uh, bring this conversation closer to us. Now I would like to continue with this panel and ask about these subjects and how this affects childhood. How is armed conflict affecting child, uh, childhood? I would like to invite Hector Saul from Honduras to share a little bit more on this topic. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Endro, uh, Hector Saul Hernandez from UNHCR. And in the Central American region, we have armed violence and overall violence affecting everyone, children, adolescents. Reason why we're here today. We want to know a little bit more about this subject. Before I begin, and speaking about the causes affecting uh, the Honduran, uh, Honduras uh, childhood, I would like to speak about UNHCR and the government and the partners. In a study done in 2004, from 2004 through 2008, more than 247,090 people had been displaced from their neighborhoods and communities in Honduras. And 43% of displaced people close to 106,246 children and adolescents were displaced during those years. Considering that, UNHCR asks the question, what was the root cause of the displacement? What is happening in Honduras, my country? And with the work that we have done with World Vision and Alianza Honduras with Jennifer here, we learned that this is a complex situation. In Honduras, we have armed violence. We have uh, criminal organized groups. We have armed conflict because we have an army, because uh, there is a blurry line on how to define this conflict. 
And as I said, we have maras, we have gangs at a national and international level. We have drug trafficking groups. We have uh, security forces recruiting adolescents over 18 years of age to become part of these security entities affecting or harming or violating the rights. And because of this, we have a great number of causes that I would like to share with you today as of how this is affecting children in Honduras. We have learned about several causes that are creating this uh, scourge in Honduras. First, we have the ones we can see, uh, murders and killings happening every single day in Honduras, affecting children and women. We have massacres, a lot of massacre in Honduras. Just this year, we have registered more than six massacres in Honduras. We have sexual violence, uh, feminicides, and in Honduras, a woman dies due to violence every 32 hours. And uh, this is an alarming piece of data. We also have structural data, structural reasons. Uh, for example, gender-based violence. We have the social and territorial control exercised by the gangs, uh, by the maras, uh, by the drug trafficking groups, and forced recruitment aligned to the stigmatization of children and adolescents. And with only those causes, I have data to share with you affecting children in Honduras. Out of 700 schools in Honduras, more than 38 have registered violent acts inside the schools, institutions, or educational centers. From 2019 through 2022, 1,700 children and adolescents have been displaced from their communities. And there is even a larger displacement in those communities if there is a minor in the families. And this is alarming. And if we have a, a boy under 18 years of age, they are more likely to die due to violence uh, than by any other reason. And just in 2023, there were 713 killings of children and adolescents related to forced recruitment by gangs and maras in Honduras. Unfortunately, in Honduras, 90% of the cases are in total impunity. And every single hour, there is a report for child violence in Honduras, and I know that we have similar data in the region due to the criminal structures. I would like to share an audio for a child to tell you what he lived in this situation, what he had to go through, and the response offered to him. Okay, while we uh, take care of that, I would like to share some of the progress that we have had in Honduras. This audio was created through a document uh, named La Tarea Pendiente, or the Pending Task. This is a legal document done with Coalico, and they have a legal approach on the framework that exists in Honduras for forced recruitment. We worked on a network of forced recruitment with several organizations. And we also have uh, stories uh, so we can address and speak about recruitment in different communities in a friendly way without putting children at risk. I think we're having technical issues. Just a second. Tengo 13 años. Desde los 10 años probé la cocaína, marihuana y otra droga. Fue cuando los mareros me llevaron con ellos porque cuando mi familia se enteró, me corrió de la casa a los 12 años y entonces estuve nueve meses trabajando me llevaron a vivir con los gat dos gatilleros y me obligaban a jalar cocaína, marihuana y piedra pero un día cayeron los enemigos y mataron como cinco frente de mí pero me dijeron que me iban a dejar ir y que me, si volvía me iban a matar quemaron toda la droga, mataron como a 20 o 25 más. Entonces uno de los otros homies 
que estaba escondido en la montaña, me llevó con él y estuve tres meses, me daba una pistola porque decía que tenía que cuidarlo y tenía que ayudarle como bandera. Hasta que un día cuando él fue a la pulpería y yo lo estaba bandereando, pero le, cayeron la le cayó la policía y lo agarraron. Y entonces fue cuando me fui y en México me agarró migración y me trajeron para el centro Belén y fue cuando me mandaron para aquí donde estoy tranquilo y donde voy a seguir estudiando porque aquí estoy bien. Me siento seguro, ya, ya no puedo regresar a donde vivía porque corro peligro. So now we're going to move on to talk about the situation of Haiti and how is it affecting children. Armed violence is having a massive impact on children. As it's clearly stated in this first chart, you can see that the gangs, which are estimated to 200 in Haiti, 80% of the capital territory is being controlled by the gangs. And uh, you can see some of them are more in the Western sector. Some of them are located in the Southern and they have started gradually to move around the Southern sector too. Even we are expecting the forthcoming deployment of a multinational security mission, but currently they are still moving and they are still progressing, making the population fear for their lives. Children are affected physically and psychologically because the armed violence is resulting post-traumatic syndrome. And um, <clears throat> one of the most important things about the gangs is that for the last years, they have federated themselves into many groups. As you can see it, we have the G9 Analyze. We have also the GPEP, and uh, most recently, the Vive Ensemble. So all the gangs in the capitals have federated themselves, not only in the capitals, but all the country for the entire territory. And meanwhile, they have conducted 180 attacks against civilian population 170,000 children have been internally displaced. 900 schools have been closed due to the attack of the gangs, depriving 200,000 children from schooling. We have also documented attacks against hospitals. 13 hospitals have been looted, as well as pharmacies. 19 police stations have been attacked. Three tribunals have been attacked and 85 IDP camp have been registered to, uh, for a total of 9,254 um, 90, um, IDP uh, uh, families and children. We have also, in terms of violation, we have attack against schools library, university, and also attacking against school for children with disabilities. We have only a few uh, school for children with disabilities in Haiti, so uh, they have been attacked. We have also um, violation of child life, survival and, devo and development, killing of children. Children as young as four months have been killed as well as expectant mothers and unborn children were hit by bullets. Children fleeing violence have also been killed. For the year of 2023, 167 children have been killed. For the first semester of the year, 82 children from January to March 2024 have been killed. Child abduction have also been documented. For the year 2023, 300 children have been abducted by the gang members. 
Another violation documented is also the children associated with armed gangs. According to the National Commission for Disarmament, Demobilization and Reassertion, 400 children, including street children, have been associated, have been recruited forcibly by gang members, and they are serving as spies, ammunition carriers, guards of kidnapped victim. There are some uh, former victim of kidnapping who testified that children as young as nine years old were watching over them. We also have the cases of sexual violences of sexual violence, sexual abuses on children, and especially the girls. And one of the weapons that being used by gangs are the collective rape on women and children. For January, from January to March, 1,169 cases of gang rape on girl and women have been reported. Children as young as 11, 12, 12, 13 years old are being used as sexual slaves in the sanctuary of the gangs because their parents have no say and they have no choices. And they cannot escape those excluded areas because every single move is being controlled and every time that those families are trying to escape, they are being searched every day that they are leaving this excluded area. In terms of challenges, uh, we are lacking some legal provision to, con to really counter the use of children in the national legal framework. We also have the impunity because those gangs, they are doing their wrongdoing without being, uh, uh, without being feared by the state. The cases of SGBV are not dealt in a timely manner, and we have no access to children associated with armed gangs. But has hope, what we can say, there is one of the best lessons learned is the solidarity between the schools. For example, some schools who have been closed because they are located in some very sensitive areas have been hosted by other schools who are located in less sensitive areas. So this is one of the um, best practices that we have registered. And uh, also, uh, we have used social media to call out gangs. I remember the case of some children who have been trapped into a school because there were some clashes between gangs. And the social media made, made it viral. And finally, there has been an halt, and those children have been rescued in a timely manner. So thank you very much. Thank you, Selena. Something that I learned from the Haitians that despite this kind of situation, they always looking for the piece of hope in every action that those guys can bring to protect the children. Thank you for sharing with us. And yeah, no, we're just going to take some time for questions because we know this part has been quite technical. Um, you have like lots of information on the legal framework. So before moving to the programmatic part, we wanted to allow some time to uh, see if you have any questions and you need for clarity on the differences between those two contexts, armed violence and armed conflict, the differences in terms of the legal framework and then the implications. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the wonderful pr presentations. It's, it's a half a question, half a comment. Um, looking into the differences, um, it's clear that the uh, legal framework, the international legal frameworks are different. But then when we see, when we go to the uh, armed violence, I like how you've presented. And then you, you look into the three major points um, you've shared. Uh, first one being on the criminalization or not of child recruitment in the legal in the national legal frameworks and the second one to the level to the extent uh, to which um, children recruited are or not considered victims and uh, are or not um, forced to go through the justice system or to what extent diversion is or not applied to them and what level of resources or programs they can access right so all of that i think it's up to the national 
framework. So it is not a given. It's not because it's an armed violence, not a conflict that you cannot criminalize it, actually. We should be advocating for the criminalization. I think it's important to step back and, and see what are the key principles that are shared regardless of the framework and then what we would like to advocate for, which is at the end of the day is the criminalization, that the programs are available and so on. And my question then is, um, if you know of any possibly good example, especially in the region because it's the most affected by armed violence um, in regards to either decriminalization or um, uh, reforms in terms of the juvenile justice systems that um, are basically looking into considering these children as victims or that can access diversion or partly diversion or programs. Any good example that you may know of that you would like to, to share, particularly for um, armed violence context? Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak about this one. Advocacy. For Spanish, I would like to use the term influence the conversation. And in that sense, I think that Latin America has a lot of knowledge and experience. And we have a lot of knowledge and experience here. And this is one of the aspects that we need to consider when we create spaces so we need to open up the opportunity so we can bring together all experiences and from that space maybe we can ask how can i impact the funding processes if he cannot even explain these types of topics these topics require details and requires a sophistication when we explain the meaning of uh, child recruitment or adolescence recruitment in context of armed violence uh, with criminal organizations that have the ability to destabilize the states. We're not talking about criminal organizations uh, that act sporadically. We're talking about a situation that destabilizes the state and it's transnational. So this is the first aspect when we talk about advocating uh, for a global conversation, offering this type of opportunity to maybe consider other advocacies when we work on child protection in situations of crisis and armed violence. As far as the practices in terms of regulations and legal developments, well, there is an important experience in Colombia. Uh, the work that Colombia has been doing is huge. But you could say, okay, but you still have one of the largest recruitment ever. And then people say, okay, well, they are in the peace process. But we wanted to reduce recruitment, but quite opposite, it went up. That takes me back to my first comment. We need new elements. Because as I heard in Kendra's intervention at some point, if we do not make a distinction about the recruitment practices, they can read the needs and they have no borders to do what they want to do. And they feed from all the weaknesses, uh, be it cultural, social, and economic, and uh, they turn it into power. So if we do not understand the difference between a gang, organized crime, a cartel, and the economic power as a source uh, to attract populations with large vulnerabilities, will respond with sophisticated legislations, but legislations that have a lot of problems to get translated in specific contexts. I'm sorry that I do not have any more specific examples, but I believe that we have examples in terms of the people working in these contexts. There should be spaces for them to tell the story. And just like the example of Coalico, this is a Colombian organization that's already influencing uh, the space in Latin America. So we can start 
talking about it so we can start counting so we can talk about the numbers we can see in the statistics thank you a quick question following along the same train of thought a quick criteria in regards to what does demobilization mean when we talk about armed violence we know that in colombia everything that's necessary for demobilization but when we talk about armed violence with these organized groups what is the opinion to talk about demobilization when these children are being recruited by these types of groups jose thank you for asking that question it doesn't really exist the system talks about the internal legal system should consider kind and child-friendly systems to children involved in crime. Those child-friendly systems have restorative justice services, but applying them, it's quite difficult. Based on what Colombia has done, when we talk about demobilization, demobilization, when we talk about reintegration and to be able to ensure that they are able to uphold their rights. We must recognize the needs of these population. This is a very interesting point, specifically when we speak with people that work with population that are demobilized, specifically children that have a a lot of influence from a criminal organization and they say oh no it's different it's a different type of population we right now have huge challenges to be able to continue because they say it's a different population in regards to the experiences that they've had and in regards to how they have been used so i'm just you know gathering a point in regards to the need to further open up this conversation the same tools cannot be used and transferred without considering the fact that these phenomena are different. Thank you very much for the audience. And um, now we would learn as to what we should keep in mind in programming for Glenda Carson from UNICEF Latin America. Thank you, Kendra. So thank you. And it was quite powerful hearing the stories both from Honduras and from Haiti because many of the things that you can imagine experienced by the child is similar to armed conflict but there's something different in what happens within that and I'd like to begin by returning to some of the things that um, previous presenters talked about Marilena and Hector at the beginning when we're talking about, and some of you heard me talking about it on Monday, about space. And, and when we're thinking about the programming response, we have to think about that space that's been taken by these gangs, by these organized criminal networks, and how we respond to that, that, that uh, reality. So when we look at why do gangs and criminal organizations um, begin or how do they flourish so well we think about the political space and the polit the space not even political but the space in the country that the state isn't occupying they're not occupying by there's no public services there not occupying because there's a serious public security issue, not occupying because there's a high level of impunity in the justice system. And in those situations, the, the gangs have a place that they can flourish. They can offer that in some ways, although maybe kind of twisted, um, but it's something that they're offering. So there's a, a, a thing about that space and that citizen state relationship that allows them to come in. Now, it's not only at the state level where we're thinking about the space. We're also thinking about the individual. You know, the individual who's seeing constantly violent images of power. When we're talking to some of the children who are attracted to gangs, I'm talking about attracted. I know they're not always attracted to them and they're often victims. But when you're talking to some of them who've been, you know, when I say talk about, 
but he has money. You know, he has the the chains on his. You know, he, he you know he. There's a, a that that violent image that somehow attracted. Uh, there, there's an attraction to, and we look at the, you know, sort of that toxic masculinity within that, and then we also look at some of the community issues where that space is there that the the gangs and the armed groups are taking advantage of, which is where you have systematic exclusion, where you have perceptions, and I am saying perceptions, of economic deprivations. And so these are places where the gangs and the art criminal groups take advantage of to be able to take over that space in some of those communities. There was a Secretary General's report that came out on armed violence. And in that framework, in that paper, they talked about two types of responses. There was a, um, a report that was done. And then subsequent to that, there was a, a group of experts from the different countries. And they talked about two, um, two responses, which recognize that difference in that space and what, what that meant. It also is that group actually closed with the adoption of the SDGs because they found, they thought their goal had been recognized because it was in the SDGs and in two places. And we had some of the questions earlier on that. One was uh, the target on homicide rates and the other was the target on being able to um, uh, uh, but feel safe in your community. So they have two different ones. One is direct interventions, and the direct interventions specifically target risk factors associated with actors and instruments of armed violence. Typical direct interventions would include restrictions on carrying arms, targeted policing, seizure, gun-free zones, um, working within the you know, restrictions of different causes for the violence, such as the alcohol or that. Indirect is the development of focused and sensitive, or, or things that are focused and sensitive to the risk factors, the resilience factors, but they don't only impact on armed violence, right? So those safe spaces, that we have, the school completion programs, preschool enrichment programs, parent training programs. We often talk about um, juvenile justice law reform, all those um, indirect things that create a positive environment and help rebuild that citizen state relationship. So there's two things here, I hope it's clear we have the prevention uh, direct and indirect, and also the response, direct and indirect. And I hope we'll hear more of it when the uh, people are presenting their programs. Thank you very much. And to understand how we reflect this, we would like to hear some of the good practices carried out to be able to protect um, the reintegration of boys and girls affected by armed violence in Brazil and Honduras. I have the honor the pleasure of presenting Rosana Vega. She is a chief protection and also personal friend in UNICEF Brazil. Rosana, hello to everyone there. I do apologize for not being here in person, but we are working, responding in the emergency because of the floods in the south of the country. With the six minutes that I have, I certainly hope that I'm able to share and part of what we've been able to advance on. I think it's also very important for us to be able to include in this thematic understanding the armed conflict in comparison to armed violence and everything related to the humanitarian aspects in Brazil. The concept of armed violence, it was strengthened in the past few years. We used to talk about homicides and we've really worked on understanding armed violence as that context that does not only generate homicides, but it generates negative effects and the uh, comprehensive development of boys, girls, and adolescents. In that sense, and to have better understanding of the situation in regards to the amount of homicides that we've had since 2016 and 2020 have been 35,000. 
in the entire country, but also understanding that it's quite defined in regards to who are the targets. Usually they are black adolescent boys within vulnerable territories. Something important to highlight is that when we start to think about how do we work on this? How do we move forward on a different type of agenda? As some of the previous speakers have stated, sometimes we don't have the legal context or even a context for us to work on topics that are related to other, other types of situations. So we need to think about how to be able to move forward on this topic. First, the concept of armed violence to understand our homicides is uh, last of the violations of violation of the human rights of children, specifically in the life of adolescents from zero to 15 years of age, but trying to also work in an environment of protection itself. When we talk about homicides and armed violence in Brazil happen because there are conflicts in regards to rival gangs, which have an action at a national and international level. Some are famously known like Comando Termelio and the, the PPTC. And some are in regards to the armed conflicts between the police and themselves and armed groups themselves. So many times what happens is that they choose an hour in which they go in and out of the school. And many times there are children that are going or leaving school become random victims, not because they're recruited. It's important to highlight that fact because we've talked a lot about recruitment, but there's this other concept, this population that's been affected by armed violence. So how do we continue on? We thought that it was quite interesting to work in different areas of Brazil, where we find areas like Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Arrecife, San Luis, Manaus, Belém, Fortaleza, El Salvador. And then we work in a framework of being able to understand, along with the municipalities, the community, the family, and the children themselves, so that we understand how to do it, how to work on this. We have identified that the territory, the neighborhood, and being in a very specific place is one of the most important factors to consider. So this is why in each of these eight cities, we've chosen a territory or a neighborhood to work on. The working component has four specific lines in regards to being able to work the prevention of violence since early childhood, not only promoting, as we've seen previously, the adolescents that could be victims of homicide, but also how to promote an environment of care and protection from early childhood. And also another track in regards to education and a strategy that we've developed here, that it's called Education That Protects specifically so that school continues to be uh, area of protection in the situation. And also the mental health of adolescents. We've seen that the exposure of being part of one of these functions of criminal gangs, it's related to different situations, not only economical, but also in regards to mental health, so we've worked with the empowerment of youth, but also in regards to how to support specifically rep work on repression of these groups. And I am wrapping up, yes. And uh, uh, the other two working lines in regards to working and ensuring that they have working on labor opportunities. So it's not crime, it's not the only labor option because they don't have any money, we need to work with them. 
under the umbrella of the integration of all four programs and the strengthening of the protection services, including the data and the information. Thank you. Thank you, Rosana. Right now, I'd like to invite Jennifer from Honduras so that she could share some of the great practices in regards to integration and working with children affected by armed violence. A pleasure. My name is Jennifer Cartagena. I am from Casa Alianza Honduras. And I'd like to introduce to present a topic in regards to what's happening in our country. People in Honduras daily are at risk of the violation of their rights, like all these different topics that we've addressed. When we talk about forced displacement, victims of human trafficking, recruitment, and the use of boys, girls, and adolescents to be able to create or further being used by gangs and maras. So Casa Alianza Honduras, I'd like to talk about what it is. It's a recognized organization within Honduras because Casa Alianza helps these children And one of the best practices where we provide comprehensive care. But for this, we would like to talk about all the programs. We would like to focus on two. the mixed residential program where the children live in Honduras, Tegucigalpa, the capital, and where they comply with some profiles, which is human trafficking, displacement, other different topics that we've addressed. These children receive specific services like medical care. They receive psychosocial support. They receive a food basket, workshops and trainings. But I would also like to highlight that we have a family reintegration process. So children that live in this institution are sent from the reintegration process. They leave our facility and then they're trained to be part of the family reintegration process since they leave this facility or from other organizations, they can also receive these services. And that's a really good practice that we've had thus far. In the last few years, we always provide these services and we try to ensure that it's comprehensive. We develop trainings, not only for the families, but also to children. One of the purposes of Casa Alianza is that it trains the staff so that it can guarantee that everyone is well trained to be able to approach these complex topics that we have to work on daily when we have we receive a new case. This is another good practice, not only training of the staff, but also training the beneficiaries of the program. Another one of the best practices, and it used to be a big challenge before, we do have meetings or partnerships with other organizations. With the purpose of the fact that if we receive a case and we don't have a specific service, for that boy or girl, we have mapped out key stakeholders, meaning other organizations, meaning that if we cannot maybe provide the service of relocation, meaning moving the child from one place to another within the same country, then we do have another partner that provides that sort of services. So this is something that allows us to expand the types of services and being able to provide better coordination to provide more benefits to the children. Another one of the best practices we've had is focusing on human rights. In Casa Alianza, we have the commitment of ensuring that these children are trained in understanding what are their rights, including the right to education, the right to health, and being part of a healthy environment. We also carry out recreation activities, they go to museums, to movie theaters, to be able to further promote good mental health. We also have seed capital with the 
purpose of specifically is a migrant returnee or migrant returnee that needs some sort of protection is to provide a financial seed capital so that they can create a business and be relocated in a part of Honduras where they can be safe. If you have any doubts and if you want to learn a little bit more about our programs, I am quite willing and give me a second. I'm willing at the end of this session, believe me, it will be a very fruitful experience for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Each panelist here would certainly, you know, give us their own meeting because the topics are, you know, quite fascinating. Before moving on to Sandra, I'd like to say that we've learned about some of the concepts we've been challenged now by the data in regards to the violence in Haiti, Honduras, and Brazil. And we received hope now based on the good practices and some of the suggestions in regards that we should add to our programs.